In this video, we will see how to perform frequency analysis using multisig and then check if the frequency response we get actually matches with what the theory predicts it should be. So we're going to look at two examples. The one first one will be the RC circuit, which we have seen a lot of times in the class. And the second one will be an operational amplifier, which is an active amplifier. And this was the amplifier which you used in your lab too. So first, let's look at the RC circuit. So let's, no, first let's build it. A blank temperature should be fine. The circuit should always have a ground. So first let's put a ground. Then we need a sinusoidal signal source. So let's go to signal voltage sources, AC voltage. Next we need a resistor. Let's go to basic resistor, 1K is fine. Next we need a capacitor. Capacitor, 1 microfarad is fine. Let's finish the circuit. Let's put the crown right there. Okay, so now that the circuit is finished, let's add some labels so that we can use them to refer to them. VI as the input, VO as the output. Okay, so in this circuit now, my input is between these two points and my output is across the capacitor. And this is the configuration which we have looked at in the class, and this is our basic low pass filter. Now, in order to do frequency analysis, let's go to simulate, analysis and simulation. Let's select AC sweep. Starting frequency is 1 hertz, that's fine. Stop frequency is, let's say, 10 kilohertz. Sweep type, choose decade among all these other types. Decade means the x axis will be logarithmic and it will be log base 10. Number of points 10 is fine. Vertical scale, I want to use decibels and one. And we have our frequency response. The top curve is a magnitude response. The bottom curve is a phase response. Okay, now that we have the frequency response, let's perform a simple sanity check first. If you look at the magnitude response, as the frequency increases, the magnitude goes down which is what it should be for a low pass filter. Now let's see what else the theory tells us about it. Okay, as per calculations we saw in the class, this is the transfer function of from the input to the output, where omega c is one over rc, and the phase response is negative tan inverse omega or omega c. Now please pause the video here and write down the magnitude and the phase response for this particular transfer function and verify if this is indeed the phase response. All right. So, so what if this is the transfer function, what can we say from it? Let's do a simple, uh, simple substitution checks. So first, if we say omega if you substitute omega as zero in the upper transfer function, you can see that the magnitude response will be one. That means the gain should be one at frequency zero. And the phase response, the phase shift should also be zero. So let's see if that is indeed the case in our phase response. As omega tends to zero, the magnitude is zero decibels, which means as a value, it is one. And as omega tends to zero, the phase is also zero. That means that particular substitution checks out. Let's look at another substitution, which is omega tends to infinity. If you substitute omega as infinity, you'll see that the magnitude response tends to zero, and the phase response tends to minus pi over two, which is minus 90. Let's see if this checks out too. Again, as frequency tends to infinity, the magnet in decibels, the graph seems to be going towards minus infinity, which means the actual value is going towards zero, which, which is what it should be. And the phase response as frequency tends to infinity, 
is asymptotically going towards minus 90, which is minus pi over 2. So both the magnitudes and the phase response, at least for the substitutions which we made, checks out. So we have seen what happens when the frequency is very small and the frequency is very high. So now let's see what happens at the transition region. Okay. So now let's see what the theory tells us about the transition. And this is when we look at what happens when omega is equal to omega c, which is called the corner frequency. Okay. If you substitute omega as omega c, then you can verify that the, the magnitude which is uh, 20 log of our actual magnitude value would be minus 3 dB. And the phase response at omega c will be pi over 4. It should be minus pi over 4. Okay, so that means it's minus 45 degrees. And, and if we have these exact values, R is 1 kilo ohms and capacitance is 1 microfarad, then the exact corner frequency should be 159.95 hertz. So now let's see if this is what we're getting in our frequency response. So again, remember, the magnitude should be minus 3 dB, and the phase response should be minus pi over 4, and the frequency should be 159. Let's see if all those things match up. So we want to see the x-axis when y is minus 3 dB. Okay, so let's go minus 3 is right about there. Okay, so when, my, when y is minus 3 dB, that means my frequency is 159 hertz. Let's see what my phase response is. Again, let's go to 159.001. I guess that's close enough. My y-axis is minus 45, so again, my corner frequency is close to 159 hertz, while uh, my magnitude response is minus 3 dB, my phase response is minus pi or 4, minus 45, all of which are exactly according to what the theory says they should be. Okay, so now we have looked at low frequency, high frequency, and the transition region. Um, so now if we have a curve, which is a function of frequencies, or any function, which is f of x, let's say, if we verify f at three different points, would that be enough to say, or f is exactly what it should be? In general, no. If you, if, if you have values at only three points, there can be infinitely different, infinitely many functions which can pass through those three points, right? So we need to do more than just check at three different points, okay? So that's why it will be important for us to check the slope the transition region. Now the slope is also important from practical perspectives is this is the slope tells us how fast the transition happens from the pass band, uh, pass band to a stop band. Right? So next look at what the theory tells us about what the slope should be, which is in general more important than just the specific values. So let's look at our transfer function once again. So if this is a transfer function, then I can write the magnitude response as, as this. Now, if you did pause the video and work this out as I asked you to do before, then please verify if you got the right answer here. Okay. So if this is a magnitude response, now notice that when omega is greater than omega c, or in fact it's much greater than omega c, then omega or omega c squared will be much greater than one. So under those conditions, and remember, if you're looking at the transition region, then omega is actually greater than omega c. So we can approximate this particular ratio as simply one over omega or omega c. Okay. Now, if I do, uh, if I convert this into decibels, that is 20 log my magnitude response. So this will be minus 20 log omega plus 20 log omega c. Now on the magnitude response diagram, the x-axis is log of omega, right? So that means minus 20 should be the slope. So this actually says since log is to the base 10, that means if, if, I, if my omega 
uh, increases tenfold, that means if it goes from 1k to 10k, then in decibels, my decibel value should drop by 20 decibels. So that's what the theory tells us. Let's see if this is indeed the case on our frequency response diagram, on our magnitude response diagram. Okay, this is a magnitude response. So let's say I want to put my cursor one at 1k. Okay, 1k, my this magnitude response is minus 16. So if I uh, if I look at 10k, then I would expect minus minus 36 decibels. Okay, so let's see where my cursor two. This is my cursor two, and right, 10k, and my y two is minus 35.96. It's almost minus minus 36, right? So so I went from 1k to 10k. That means log of omega uh, changed by one, and my uh, in decibels, magnitude response dropped by minus 20, which is what the theory says it should be. So let me summarize here. So we started with this particular circuit, which is our RC circuit, which we look at in the class. And we look at the frequency response of that circuit. So when we look at our theory, the theory itself tells us that at zero frequency, the magnitude should be zero decibels and the phase response should be zero, which is what we see here. When my frequency tends to infinity, the magnitude should go to zero. That means the decibels value should go to minus infinity, which is what we're seeing here. And the phase response should asymptotically go to minus pi over two, which is what we're seeing here. Now the corner frequency, that is when the magnitude response is minus 3 dB. Uh, so the, the frequency should be 159, 159 hertz, which is what we're seeing here. And at that particular frequency, the, the phase response should be minus 45, minus pi over 4, which is also what we're seeing here. And the theory also tells us that the slope of this should be minus 20, which is also what we verified here. Okay, so this is how you verify but that uh, whether the frequency response is uh, according to what the theory says it is. Let's now look at the frequency analysis of an amplifier. In your lab two, you were given an amplifier in a box. In fact, this is a schematic of the circuit which was in there. Now, if you recall, you had to pro provide two different power supplies a positive and a negative power supply, and the ground is to ref reference these voltages. Uh, and you also see a 741 IC here. This is an operational amplifier IC. We will spend a lot of time talking about operational amplifiers and their applications. So for now, we don't need to bother about how the circuit is working and what exactly this is. All you need to know is just applying the input here. This was your left-hand side of the breadboard in your lab and you're measuring the output at pin number six. So uh, now what I wanna do here is I wanna see how the gain or uh, gain of this amplifier changes with frequency. And before we continue, I wanna mention for this specific amplifier, the gain is specified as negative R1 over R2. Since R1 over R2 are equal here, the gain will be minus one. Again, the details we will talk about later. Now, when you say again is minus one, that's at actually a DC voltages. Now, for most amplifiers, for especially operational amplifiers, the gain decreases as frequency increases. So let's see how that changes. Okay, again, AC sweep. Let's start from one hertz to one megahertz, that's fine. Save time and vertical decibel one. Okay, so Again, top, you have the magnitude response, bottom, you have the phase response. Now, if I want to find the uh, bandwidth or if I want to find the cutoff frequency, I need to find the frequency where the magnitude response is minus 3 dB. So, again, let's use my cursors. I want to go to minus 3 dB. So it's about 494.5, so about 500 kilohertz is the bandwidth of this, of this amplifier. 
and the gain is 1. Now let's see if the, uh, if the bandwidth changes if I want a different gain. So next let's go with the gain of 10. That means I should make this resistance 10 kilo ohms. As I said, the gain is the ratio of these resistors. At this point, since this is 10 kilo ohm, this is 1 kilo ohm, the gain is 10. Now let's, in fact, let's just go for 100 so that we will cover a wide range of gains. Okay, now the gain of this amplifier is technically minus 100. But in frequency analysis, we are only worried about the, uh, about the magnitude. And we don't really care about the gain is negative in this case. So again, let's do uh, analysis and simulations. Is it sweet? Everything good? Okay. So again, for the uh, for the cutoff frequency, I need to find the minus three dB. Now remember this: since that the transfer function um, measures the output to the input, and the output uh, gain is hundred. At zero frequencies, the magnitude will be forty dB. And as you can see, y2 is 39.9, which is 40 dB over here. So to find the minus 3 dB point, I need to find the x-axis point where the magnitude is 37 dB, which is which corresponds to the uh, minus 3 dB point. So 37 would be right there, which is 9.5 kilohertz. So about, let's say 10 kilohertz. So when I when I changed my or when I increased my gain from one to hundred, my bandwidth went from 450 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz. Right. So let's say now if you want to if you're making this uh, an amplifier to amplify audio signals, right? Audio signals go from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and if you want a gain of hundred for those signals, this particular amplifier will cut off most of the frequencies you're interested in, right? So in this case, for example, uh, using the 7409C, you cannot make an amplifier which has both gain of 100 and bandwidth of at least 20 kilohertz. So in order to get around it, what you might want to do is make two amplifiers with a gain of 10K, uh, with a gain of 10, and cascade them to get a gain of 100, right? So let's see what happens if I what the bandwidth is if I have a gain of 10. Okay. Again, go to analysis and simulations. One. Okay, this time, again, to find the, uh, the cutoff frequency, in this case, I need to find 17 decibels. 17 in there. 87 kilohertz. 87 kilohertz passes most of my the interstellar signals I want in audio signals. So right. So for gain of 10, I have a bandwidth of 87 kilohertz. So if I cascade two amplifiers, each with a gain of 10, the, the total gain will be 100, and the bandwidth will be big enough to pass all the signals I want. Right. So that's why sometimes cascading is better than using a single amplifier with high gain. Anyway, so that's how you do frequency analysis in Logisim.